Thank you. Um, hi there, I'm Gina Smilik. Um, I'm the Fed and Economy reporter at the New York Times, um, and I'm excited to moderate a really excellent panel here today on US financial market instability. Um, we have three top economists with us to walk us through the issue. Uh, Jan Hatzius is chief economist at Goldman Sachs. Bruce Kassman is man managing director and global head of economic research at JP Morgan. And James Paulson is chief investment strategist at the Leotard Group. Um, they are each going to deliver a presentation, after which I will ask them a few of my own questions and then your questions. So please go ahead and send those in as they are speaking and, you know, throughout the throughout the presentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce all three panelists right up front here, um, just in order to, you know, interrupt as little as possible once we get started here. Um, I'll then hop back in for Q&A at the end, so please, please be sending in your questions throughout. Um, Jan Hatzius is the head of global investment, the global investment research division uh, at Goldman Sachs and the firm's chief economist. Previously, he was head of global economics and markets research. He joined Goldman Sachs in their Frankfurt office back in 1997 and transferred to New York in 1999. He was named managing director in 2004 and partner in 2008. Prior to joining Goldman, he was research officer at the London School of Economics. Mr. Hatzius is a member of the economic advisory panels of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and the Congressional Budget Office. He earned a doctorate of philosophy and economics from Oxford University and holds degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Keele Institute for the World Economy. Bruce Kasman is a managing director and chief economist for JP Morgan. He serves as the global head of economic research, where he is responsible for leading a team of 30 economists worldwide um, who set the firm's economic and policy views. Mr. Kasman joined JP Morgan in 1994 and was head of European economic research between 1996 and 1999. Prior to JP Morgan, he was senior international economist at Morgan Stanley, and he started his career at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in the International Research Department. He has a PhD in economics from Columbia University. And finally, we have James Paulson, who is Chief Investment Strategy at the Leotard Group. He is a member of the Investment Committee, Authors Market and Economic Commentary, and works with the Leotard Investment Team in serving institutional, financial, and investment professional clients. He is the author of a long-running newsletter published and distributed alongside the firm's premier monthly research project, which is called Perception for the Professional. He has been an investment industry professional since 1983, most recently as Chief Investment Strategist at Wells Capital Management. And prior to that, he was Senior Managing Director and Chief uh, Investment Strategist for Investors Management Group in Des Moines, Iowa. He um, also served as President at SCI Capital Management in Cedar Rapids, and for more than 30 years has published commentary assessing economic and market trends. He earned a bachelor's degree and doctoral degree in economics from Iowa State. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mr. Hatzius, who's going to deliver our first presentation. Uh, please take it away. All right. Thanks so much. And thank you to the Levy Institute for inviting me. And it's a real pleasure to talk about our economic outlook. We have a very optimistic view of the global economy and the U.S. economy. We're above consensus on the growth numbers, but nevertheless, think that the Fed's going to be pretty slow in uh, moving to the exit, tapering in early 2022, and we have our first rate hike in early 2024, although obviously I recognize that that's a very long time away and much can happen. But if you turn to the uh, page number two in the handout, you can see a uh, you can see our numbers were in the uh, generally above consensus camp on growth, global growth. We're at 6.6 percent, that's seven tenths above consensus for 2021. We're at five percent for 2022, that's 0 0.6 percentage points above consensus. The optimistic view is concentrated in the advanced economies. I would say, especially the U.S the euro area and the uh, especially especially the uk where we have a, a very optimistic view at uh, 7.8 percent uh, more than two percentage points above consensus for uh, for this year now what are the reasons for the improvement in in the economy and i'm going to speak specifically about the us uh, if you turn the page to page three, first reason, of course, is 
the, uh, the fact that the virus is becoming much less of an issue for economic activity. We're approaching herd immunity. I know herd immunity is a controversial term, so I put it in quotation marks, but by our estimates, we're somewhere in the 60 to 70% range for the total share of the US population that has some immunity either from vaccination or from prior infection. Uh, we have seen a slowdown in daily vaccinations, pretty sharp slowdown over the past few weeks, but it, uh, we, we nevertheless think that activity in virus sensitive sectors will con continue to come back strongly. Second reason, if you turn to the next page, is that we've seen a very large easing in financial conditions. This is our financial conditions index, uh, long-standing measure, which is a weighted average of short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates, credit spreads, equity prices, and the dollar, and is currently at its easiest level on record. Now, what matters for growth is really changes in financial conditions, but we've also seen a large easing uh, in the last several quarters, not only compared with the conditions of March and April 2020, which were obviously extremely tight, but also more broadly. So that's another substantial headwind, a uh, sub substantial tailwind to growth in the, uh, in, the, in the short term, at least. And then third reason for, for strength is a massive amount of fiscal support, if you turn the page to the next page. And we can uh, see this just in terms of the total amount of extra deficit for the, from, from discretionary packages in 2021. That stands at about 12% of GDP by our estimates. And that's obviously providing a large amount of uh, tailwind. And we've, we've seen an even bigger impact in 2021 than in 2020, despite the fact that 2021 is going to feature a significantly better economy. So this is a structural, cyclically adjusted, substantial tailwind to, to growth. Now, that has, of course, raised concerns, especially the last point, but I would say probably all these points taken together, raised concerns that we're going to see a significant overheating of, economic, of the economy. Uh, Larry Summers and Olivia Blanchard have been maybe most prominent in making this case. And the basic case they make is that as of the fourth quarter of 2020, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that GDP was only about 3% below potential. That's about $700 billion. Now, Congress is pumping something on the order of two and a half to $3 trillion into the economy to support activity. And that means that unless the multiplier on that two and a half to $3 trillion is very small, we're going to get a large overheating of the economy, a large move beyond potential, and that's going to cause high inflation and not just a short-term inflation pop, but actually a more significant overshoot that is going to be harder to bring under control. Now, what, what, um, how should we think about this? What, what is our view? My view is less worried than that, not because it couldn't happen in principle that you overstimulate, of course that could happen, but when I go through the numbers as carefully as, as I can, it doesn't seem that we're set for a really large overshooting. And, if you turn the page to page six, there, there is a, a, a bit of an accounting here that goes through the total impulse to GDP that we're likely to see from these different, uh, from these different sources. And I should say that all of this 
is taken as relative to the fourth quarter of 2020. And by our estimates, the number, the, the impulses from the reopening of the economy from the easy financial conditions and from the uh, and, and from the large amount of fiscal stimulus, as well as pent up saving, that's sort of a, a, a leftover consequence of easy fiscal policy last year, combined with an economy that was largely shut down in, in some sectors. When we, when we take all these things together, we get something like a 6% boost to the level of GDP by the fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of, of next year. Now that's of course an estimate, but, uh, and, and there are definitely significant uh, uncertainties around that, but our best guess is that we get about a 6% boost and then, then that boost diminishes somewhat in 2022. So in 2022, this would be, if you just take these numbers literally, be a reason for slightly below trend growth. And I should say that this incorporates an assumption that President Biden is going to manage to pass most of the American jobs plan and, and American families plan that he has, uh, that, that, that he has uh, proposed. So we are, we are building in infrastructure and, and other things. But it's about a 6% boost. Now, what does that mean for the question of overheating, if you turn to the next page, you can see where that leaves our estimate of the output gap. We're estimating a significantly bigger output gap than CBO as of the end of last year in the five to 6% of GDP range. And we therefore think that if you add 6% or so to uh, the output gap from these different boosts, we, we do overshoot full employment, but only by a little bit, only by about 1% of GDP, which if you assume that the linkage between economic utilization and inflation is anywhere close to the sort of relationship that we've seen over the past several decades, would only give you a small overshoot of inflation relative to the 2% target. Now, admittedly, uh, there are a lot of assumptions and estimates in here. In particular, output gaps are admittedly hard to measure. But if you take a look at the next page, the, if, you, if we um, do a cross check on something that we can measure maybe a little bit more easily than the level of potential GDP relative to actual GDP, namely employment, and in this case, we look at the prime age employment to population ratio as something that has been pretty stable over the decades and prob is probably a reasonable proxy for utilization uh, in the labor market, we see that there's still a very substantial amount of underemployment, even as of the, the March numbers. We'll get another number on this tomorrow. We'll probably see a sizable increase. But I would say that when I look at the labor market numbers, it's certainly consistent in my view with having had more than 3% of GDP of underutilization as of the fourth quarter of last year. Now consequently, and this is implicit of course in what I, what I said, we are less worried about a large inflation overshoot than the Summers Blanchard view would, would suggest. If you turn to the next page, uh, on page nine, it's clear that we're currently seeing a very sizable increase in year-on-year -year inflation. The core PCE numbers are probably going to be somewhere between 2.4% and 2.5% year-on-year in the, in the April data, which we'll get towards the end of this month. But that is really driven by some very short-term effects. A base effect as we're cycling the big price declines of early 2020 and boosts from the reopening of the economy 
especially in the service sector, such as airlines, hotels, uh, etc., and also some upward pressure on goods prices from bottlenecks, for example, in semiconductors. We think that the base effects are going to start turning around within a month or two already. Uh, the reopening effects are going to last somewhat longer, but they ultimately are also temporary. And there are also some more temporary special factors that are probably going to be a drag on inflation as we go into late this year and early next year. Healthcare costs are a particular case in point where we're likely to see uh, less of a, we, we have been seeing a boost, we're likely to see a drag from that. Longer term, the, the question, as you go beyond the next year or so, the question on inflation is really, what is the relationship between improvement in the economy and especially improvement in the labor market and inflation? What's the slope of the Phillips curve in the, in the jargon? If you turn to the next page, the, our, our, our view of this is that we'll continue to see quite a flat Phillips curve. It'll take a lot of improvement in the labor market to push inflation higher over time. Uh, we're, we're assuming that the, it therefore takes until 2023 to get above, really get above 2% and then 2024 to get above 2% to a degree that would be sufficient for uh, to, to persuade the Fed to start hiking the funds rate. Now, more broadly, what's our, our Fed policy outlook? Our expectation is that, uh, and you can, you can turn the page here, uh, our, our expectation is that tapering, which re de depends on substantial further progress on employment and inflation, that that will be with us in early 2022. We think they'll start talking about it over the summer. They'll drop increasing hints as we get into the fourth quarter. It gets announced perhaps at the December meeting to start in, uh, in January. We're expecting that it will take about a year for tapering to be completed. $15 billion of reduction in asset purchases per meeting. There are eight meetings and we're starting from 120. So that takes us into late 23, late 22, early 23 for the tapering to be complete, completed. Rate hikes could in principle commence thereafter, but you do need full employment, 2% inflation and confidence in a moderate overshoot. And we think that probably means core PCE needs to be something like 2.2% and gradually headed higher uh, based on what they see in the rest of the economy. And we think that's probably an early 2024 kind of, kind of event, which is approximately a year later than market pricing at this point. Lastly, on the Fed, the, as far as the speed of rate hikes is concerned, I am sympathetic to the idea that it's ultimately going to be steeper than what markets are pricing. I think the funds rate is going to rise to higher levels than the 2% or just over 2% numbers that are, that are currently, uh, currently priced in the market. I do think they're probably going to start relatively slowly. So we've only got two hikes penciled in for 2024, but thereafter I would accept, expect an acceleration and ultimately 100 basis points per year a hike every quarter or so seems like a reasonable guess for what the speed is going to be. Now, let me just uh, spend a little bit uh, more of time on the rest of the world. Uh, if you could just flip the page to the uh, vaccinations, since that is really the main driver of where we, you know, where, where the strength in the, in the forecast is coming from. Uh, you know, obviously we've seen a big increase in the US as far as vaccination is concerned. And we've seen a, um, uh, you know, a, a head start for the US and the UK in terms of how the economy performs as well. 
and um, but but we think that ultimately we'll get to roughly the same place across the major economies in terms of the percentage of the population that's vaccinated. And uh, uh, in particular in the Euro area, we're now seeing a sharp acceleration. If you turn to uh, the next page, seeing a, a sharp acceleration right now, the percentage of the population in the Euro area that's being vaccinated every day is actually slightly higher than, than in the US. Germany in particular has seen a very uh, sharp improvement. And we therefore think that the gap in growth rates, uh, if you turn the page, between the US and uh, Europe in particular is, uh, you know, it's quite, quite high at the, at the moment. Uh, the uh, US is, is outperforming significantly as far as uh, growth is concerned. But we think that uh, Europe is uh, is catching up, and we'll see a um, large uh, large pickup, especially in the in the third quarter in Europe as well. Ultimately, uh, you know, we do think that the, there will be some convergence in terms of the growth rates between the U.S. and uh, and Europe. Um, and uh, if you could turn turn the page uh, just once more. Uh, we also have, you know, of course, uh, you know, dovish views on on um, monetary policy in the U.S. and even more dovish views in other parts of the the global economy, just given the starting point. But I'm going to um, stop here and uh, turn it back to Gina. Great, thank you so much for. Uh a really good presentation there. Um, Mr. Kassman, I think we'll just go ahead and go straight and jump straight into yours and then do questions at the end. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, thank you, Jan, for going through a, an outlook which uh, does a, a decent amount of work for me, particularly in terms of the, uh, the near-term US outlook. We have a very similar view and I'm not gonna spend too much time um, repeating much of what, what has already been said. I think what I'd like to do is address the issue of stability from the macroeconomic point of view. Um, obviously, there's a financial element to this, which, which moves somewhat separately, but I do think inherently um, st instability that creates real problems in terms of the economy ultimately has to show up in both. And what I really wanna emphasize is against the backdrop of a, of a, of a year that we think is gonna look very much the way Jan described, um, the idea that what we're seeing in this uh, economy, both US and globally right now, is a very different path than what we saw after the global financial crisis. And I guess where I'll differ a little bit from Jan is I'll emphasize far more the differences in terms of this, the, the path of inflation and ultimately the path that policymakers take here um, in relation to those. And hopefully also therefore uh, some of the uh, more underlying issues that we, we faced last uh, cycle in terms of the contrast we're gonna see this time. And basically what I wanna say is that I think what we should understand is that we're moving towards balance right now uh, after having had a huge shock in 2020 uh, that while the shock was huge and history tells us that shocks like the pandemic uh, tend to have lasting and very big scarring uh, we are getting scarring uh, in the uh, global and the u.s economy right now but it's not the type of scarring that tends to have macroeconomic impediments associated with it and i don't think it will be a significant lasting drag on growth, it's not showing up in balance sheets, it's not showing up in overhangs in terms of real activity. And then I'd like to think about the policy environment as Jan described it, as one where we're seeing what I think is very different policy setting than we did the last cycle, both from central banks and from fiscal authorities. And one that is very constructive in terms of addressing what I think are two very central problems in the macro space. One has been low inflation and the other has been uh, low potential growth. Um, and I think it's the success on that side, um, which I think will end up tell telling the tale about how this cycle plays itself out. Uh, I would not ignore the risks that these policies uh, um, incorporate. And I think um, there is uh, issues on financial stability. And I think as the panel before us really did hit home, we have a problem in terms of not having the appropriate counterweight in terms of uh, regulatory oversight to, to manage that. Um, but I generally believe that 
we're in a situation where asset price inflation is not representing at this point credit problems or imbalances in the real economy. That reflation is real, but it, reflation is not inflation and there's a long space to go from one to the other. Uh, and that the risks that we're taking right now are well worth uh, um, uh, taking in against the backdrop of the alternatives if we didn't uh, uh, move down this path. Now, let me just start with a few other comments about the, the outlook. Uh, I won't get into detail about this year, but as Jan mentioned, this is going to be a gangbuster year. We also have 7% US GDP growth over the four quarters of 2021. Globally, 6%. That would be, if realized, the best outcome really since the early 1980s. Uh, we have inflation rising pretty rapidly here. We have both US and global CPI inflation over the course of this year uh, at over 3%. Uh, context is important here because, of course, what is happening right now is we're following the deepest downturn peak to trough we saw towards World War II, and we're recovering, and we're recovering very quickly. We're recovering from inflation rates globally, which went down, um, if we exclude food and energy, to their lowest levels that we have on record here. So I think a lot of what's happening here is a rebound uh, from depressed levels. Uh, there's some overshooting in certain elements happening, but it is a a normalization, not, not a sustained overshooting. And I would emphasize the composition of growth here. Uh, if we were right, we turned into 2021 with global GDP roughly four percentage points below its pre-crisis path. Uh, but our estimates would put consumption as the laggard here, and it's sitting more than six percentage points below its pre-crisis uh, path. And much of the boost we're expecting uh, to the global growth picture in the next uh, six to 12 months is coming from consumption. Uh, of course, the U.S. fiscal story is part of that, but I actually think in a broader sense, what we should recognize is that the story is really about pent-up demand uh, in uh, Europe, pent-up demand in EM getting activated as the year goes on, if we're right, that we can actually break the link between the virus um, and mobility. Uh, if we're right, we're going to end the year with the global economy still a half a percentage point off of its pre-crisis pace. I'd say that's a glass half full in the sense that it's almost a full recovery. It's not quite a full recovery. Uh, and we're going to end the year with underlying inflation um, in the US and, and basically globally in our forecast sitting at about uh, 2%, which is basically putting it pretty close to where it was before the crisis. And that's a pretty phenomenal message that we're pretty close to being back on track effectively uh, within um, six or seven quarters of when this shock hit. Um, the other thing I think we want to talk about is scarring, because you could have good performance now, but it not necessarily signal anything sustained. And the real issue around the GFC against the backdrop of history is whether there are damages that are being done that's going to have a lasting negative impact. Uh, certainly after the global financial crisis, we saw that. We saw that in the reverberations in the European sovereign crisis, uh, the EM credit uh, tightening that took place in 2013-14. And of course, we also had this secular drag uh, on credit, on balance sheets. That was a, a problem throughout that expansion. Uh, I don't want to ignore scarring this time. I think if you look at the US economy, you can see key pockets of problems. Uh, urban areas are going to have problems. Small businesses are going to have problems. There are going to be uh, credit issues that are going to play out slowly in some areas. Um, I think you see globally a number of EM countries that are going to lag well behind. But to me, the key is that these are not scarring events that are affecting the uh, ability for credit to be uh, created. They're not uh, ones which are creating uh, a dynamics which are going to uh, um, restrain policymakers in a broad macro way. And as a result, they're not going to be macro drags. And I think that is a testament in part to the targeted nature of supports that came in the crisis. Um, I think it is partly a reflection of the nature of the shock, which is not the same as what happened when we got hit by the global financial crisis. And I would emphasize in this regard, not only do we not have scarring, but we have a huge tailwind in the form of household balance sheets. If our forecast is right, the consumption boost that I talked about um, a couple of minutes ago is coming with effectively saving rates in the major industrial economies coming back down to normal after having gone up roughly 10 percentage points uh, in the spring of last year and, and sitting not far from that as we get, went through the second wave in early 2021. Um, the movement back to normal, though, does reflect two full years in which savings has been somewhat by forced uh, uh, inability to spend. 
has been much higher than normal. And our estimates are that we're gonna end this year with roughly 10% of household income in terms of accumulated financial assets, which is greater than the path we were on before the crisis. How that gets uh, resolved, whether it uh, uh, gets resolved in stronger spending or uh, other types of behaviors on the household sector is un un um, unclear, but I think it is a very clearly healthier position, uh, however it works out, in a very different backdrop than what we've been used to coming out of either of the last two economic expansions. Uh, the other point I want to make about where we are is the policy side. And I want to emphasize that while the crisis management of the GFC was pretty good, the expansion management was pretty bad. Uh, we went through that expansion uh, roughly six or seven quarters into it, getting hit by a huge fiscal drag, both in the US and in the Euro area. Um, we had, in addition, I think monetary policy that didn't respond aggressively to the disinflationary forces at work. Uh, some of it was they didn't care enough. I think there wasn't enough of appreciation of the problems of low inflation. I think it was also a caution in terms of using unconventional tools. And finally, um, there was just a, a systematic overestimation of inflation and forecasts, which guided policy, uh, which central banks across the board, and I'm certainly going to uh, not single anyone out in this regard, uh, that they were very slow in um, adjusting. Uh, we are now, I think, setting the stage for an environment where fiscal policy supports are going to continue to be highly stimulative, but we're not going to have that pullback in an early fashion. And I think that's true in the US, it's true in Western Europe, it's true in Japan, and in the EM, it's a far more mixed story. But again, from a broader macro picture, uh, the limited number of countries that are going to tighten heavily in EM don't matter as much from a macro perspective. Uh, more broadly, um, as Jan has mentioned, the Fed is turned very accommodative here. It has an inflation overshooting framework. Um, the BOJ, ECB, which have much bigger inflation uh, problems, uh, are not changing all that much. But I think their tolerance for low inflation has gone down. And I, what I want to emphasize is they're committed to low for long here. Uh, and in an environment, if we're right, where fiscal policy supports stay in place, where global economy actually, um, from an output gap point of view, is pretty close to back to normal. Um, as Jan, I, I would take the same output gap measure Jan uh, showed and just highlight how dramatically different that is than what happened after the GFC. We have a positive output gap in the US less than six quarters into an expansion. It took 35 quarters after the GFC to get uh, something like that for the uh, for the developed market economies overall, and that is a huge difference in terms of your starting point. So your starting point here is one of continued fiscal supports, slack being eaten up very quickly, central bankers being uh, quite supportive. They're constrained and they continue to be constrained by the zero bound. But the important point there is that the constraints get relieved if the combination of the fiscal supports and other positive developments in terms of credit and financial conditions actually begin to raise our star, which is one of the things that I think is embedded in our forecast. So we get traction here that goes well beyond 2021 and is really, the, um, I think, the catalyst for a, a reflationary environment taking hold. I would be um, you know, very much in Jan's camp that the way some people are talking about inflation getting high and out of control is a red herring. But I would also say, if we're right, that we're sitting here two years from now with global uh, core inflation sitting 50 to 75 basis points in the US and in the euro area, roughly 50 to 75, 50, 75 basis points higher than where it was uh, in the last four or five years of the previous cycle. That's a material and important change that we should recognize uh, is taking place in the global economy. And I would argue it's a, it's a very positive one. Now, I don't want to ignore problems here. Um, as I said up front, uh, a, a constructive macro environment, uh, a Fed that's very easy, a reflationary environment, all has the recipe of creating um, uh, pressures in terms of the financial sector, which can go well beyond what's consistent with macro stability. And I think we do have a problem here of whether we have the tools necessary to regulate the financial side as we go down the road of the macroeconomic um, uh, path we described. I think there are imbalances here that I'm maybe putting too light a touch on. Uh, their imbalances, particularly, I think, in a number of EM economies that are going to lag behind here. Uh, India, Brazil, uh, a couple of others are big countries, which in our forecast just don't ever get the full recoveries we have 
uh, elsewhere and potentially are problems both from an economic and from a, a geopolitical perspective. But I think the biggest call here is whether or not um, we're right here that you can actually use this kind of environment, this kind of jump starting of this recovery, given the fiscal ammunition we're putting at it, given what the Fed's doing, to actually lift potential growth. I mean, I think that's to me the big call here. I would argue that the fall in potential growth we saw in the US and globally over the last um, uh, 20 years has a policy component to it. And that's one of the things we should recognize. We're taking a well warranted risk in terms of trying to help boost that. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the Fed, but I'm talking about the components of the fiscal program of infrastructure and, and, uh, and, and transfers that the Biden administration is putting in place. Um, but that's coming against demographic forces. It's coming against the history of pandemic shocks, which have tended to have negative impacts. And I think the, the story will be told beyond the next couple of years, whether this reflationary and healthy growth environment actually does deliver ultimately a stronger supply side. And I'm, I'm going to take an agnostic view on that as I, as I close. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Paulson, do you want to take it away? Will do. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks to Dimitri for having me back. It's been a number of years since I got to present here, and it's always a fun group to uh, share some thoughts with. I am going to use the presentation, so I'm going to hit uh, share screen here, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll see if we can get to where I want to get. Um, okay. Let's see, oh, there we go. All right, you see that okay? I'm gonna, uh, start in here. I, um, I agree with a lot of the comments that both Jan and, uh, Jan and Bruce brought up, and um, I, I certainly see similarly strong growth here coming this year. I'm actually more in the eight to eight and a half percent camp this year in the United States, and closer to Jan, that, four and a half to five next year. Um, but I wanna focus in on, on about four different issues uh, if I could. I wanna talk first about um, what this pandemic did in, in some sense to me was put us on one of the biggest bust to boom roller coaster rides in post-war history. And I think that has some impacts, particularly on the psyches of players uh, that, that will have real impacts down the road. Talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk about the two big issues going forward, which Bruce and Jan both touched on a little bit. You know, is are we going to get runaway inflation from this or not? Um, and I think an equally big uh, uh, issue, which which Bruce touched on at the end, is is there going to be a lasting, sustainable force for better growth than what we've had maybe in decades? not just a, a boom bust, but a, a sustainable higher growth rate as a result of this. And then lastly, talk a little bit about what seemingly is just a watershed change in, in how we uh, undertake economic policies in this country, it, it, starting even with, uh, seems like there's a joint at the hip team up between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department, uh, all in one team and no independence almost anymore, but just the, what I would call the policy is go big. And, and is that going to work or is it going to be kind of a, a disaster? So that's kind of where I want to go. Let's start with this boom bus cycle. And um, this chart uh, kind of gets to that, looks a little bit at um, uh, the annual real GDP growth here year on year since 1950. And we basically, the red line is the forecast consensus right now or close to it. We've basically gone from a depressionary bust to a wartime boom here in a 12 month period. There's just nothing else like this in the entirety of post-war history, maybe not even in US history in the sense of, of going from the depths of where we went back so quickly to some of the fastest growth rates ever. And, I think part of this came, uh, understandably, this cycle to me uh, came about from overreaction by players. And uh, certainly COVID set it off, but I would say the reaction to this has been an overreaction. Now, I'm not saying there wasn't a, a very serious crisis, there obviously is, 
but I think that we went way over the top by almost all the players. This certainly here is, to me, overreaction. Um, if you sum up money supply growth and deficit GDP, we're, you know, we're, we've been persisting at 45 uh, percent in a combo package. There's just nothing like that almost in U.S. history. Um, we certainly needed policy juice, but we we got a lot more. If, if you look at what it did to businesses, they, they created a record decline in output, a record decline in jobs, and a biggest inventory liquidation ever, almost in a one month period. And I think it, it's testament to the fact that when you combine a health crisis with an economic crisis, what companies were trying to do wasn't just make it through a recession, they were trying to survive to get to the other side of this pandemic. And so they cut everything to the absolute bones, uh, thinking just how do I survive more than anything else? And then finally, consumers just sitting on massive collect savings and unspent buying power, uh, still have not spent that really, and record declines in, in credit card debt and cleaning up their balance sheets. The net result of all of this, whether it's policy response, business response, consumer response, is growth is going to be stronger than normal going forward. More policy today, more growth. More cutting today by businesses, more replacement of that in the future. More unspent buying power today, more growth down the road. And investment markets did a similar thing as well. Um, but there's just two things that I like. Certainly, I, I just show you real quick policy. I, there's no rhyme or reason to this. I just add these two up, what I call the MF economic policy indicator, summing money supply growth in the U.S. federal deficit percent of GDP. And the, the war on COVID here, there's just nothing like this. We got more stimulus introduced and we're continuing to add more every day. Uh, this is an annual average for 2020. Right now, this number is about 47% or something in that ballpark. It's, it's just off the charts. Um, we're providing more stimulus today than we did in World War I, World War II, the Vietnam conflict, the Great Depression. There's just nothing like this. Um, and that, to me, is certainly an overreaction here, which ultimately will lead to stronger growth. Um, the other important thing is in the corporate sector. This looks at trailing S&P four-quarter earnings, the S&P 500. The dotted blue line at the end is the current forecast here, consensus going out. And this is a log scale. But what's interesting, despite the fact that we had the biggest drop in GDP, the biggest drop in jobs, the biggest inventory liquidation, we had the smallest decline in earnings in the last 50 years. And we've had the quickest revival to new highs, only taking seven quarters compared to the past. Why did that occur? I think it occurred because of the excessive overreaction of cutting by companies. When you're getting down to the bone, rather than a normal recession that happens and they take time cutting costs so their earnings get really hit, they did it almost overnight. And as a result of that, uh, they, they kept earnings intact and then they've recovered a lot faster as well. This is going to be very significant for what companies do going forward without having such a big drop and taking forever to get back. Companies can get back quickly to spending and growing again uh, in a way that they haven't been able to in the past. So it, at the end of the day, to me, what this roller coaster ride is also doing is it's put uh, the economic mentalities of, of our players on a total whiplash. Going from a depressionary bust to a wartime boon has resulted in economic surprises persistently outperforming uh, even more aggressive estimates. A few weeks ago, they reported retail sales and everyone had super aggressive estimates for those numbers and they still came in better than that. This is happening with earnings from corporations. It's happening with almost every economic report. In fact, in the last 12 months, uh, if you look at over here, uh, we've had economic surprises in this country coming in in the upper quintile 80% of the time. There's just nothing like this. That's a powerful force under the stock market when you have to continually upgrade your growth outlook, your earnings outlook, and your target prices. But it's also a powerful force for greater and greater private sector activity, which bolsters growth, uh, being chronically surprised, if you will. So I think that's going to be continuing to be a force for, for growth going forward. Let's turn now to two other big issues. Um, one is inflation, and I'll come back to that in a minute. 
But the other one, which I think is almost more important to uh, Bruce's point earlier, is what happens after the fiscal cliff drops? What happens once policy starts to run out, once tapering occurs both monetarily and fiscally? Is there other forces left in the system that are sustainable forces for growth uh, beyond policy juice? Yes, we've juiced the system, but we're, we're gonna start to pull that back. Is there sustainable forces left? I really think there is. I, my guess, and that's all it is, I, I, I guess that we are gonna grow uh, sustainably and at a faster rate than we did. I don't think we're gonna return back to the two and a half percent growth rate that we had pre-COVID. I think the result of a number of things is gonna keep us on a higher trajectory growth rate, maybe for longer. Uh, certainly there's pent up demands, um, you know, and it's not just taking trips, but no one's bought clothes or, or, or gone and, and done anything else that, that's gonna come out. Um, and those will be persistent and not necessarily come all in one year. There's gonna be a whole lot more new job holders at this time next year than there are now. And brand new job holders with fresh income and a, and a more sustainable future are gonna be more aggressive in their, their uh, behaviors. Confidence, even though it's come up a lot now, is gonna be a heck of a lot higher uh, at this time next year when you bring in brand new jobs and new businesses that reopen again into the mix. We got two phenomenal things that have happened during this pandemic. A surge in household formations being driven by millennials uh, and a surge in business formations, which is almost inexplicable. But I think both will probably persist. And these are, these are conditions outside of policy that are gonna continue to drive the growth rate of this economy higher than it's been uh, for quite some time when household formations was chronically falling and so were business formations. We also, as a result of cutting inventory so dramatically, and we're seeing the impact of this in, in uh, containers and chips and houses, uh, we're gonna have the need for a massive inventory rebuild just to catch up to demand and then also replenish shelves. And I, again, I don't think that's something that'll be done all over one year, but it'll bleed out over time. We've got tremendous amount of unspent uh, idle demand sitting on the sidelines here that's gonna come out again over a multi-year period. When you build up, uh, not only do we have pent up demands, but we have the pent up ability to buy them, if you will. Uh, that, that's something we just haven't had. We've had a low savings rate over time. We've also got remarkably uh, healthy balance sheets. The debt to income ratio for households has been declining for 20 years. The debt to personal total income right now in the household sector is back to where it was in the, in the late 1990s. Um, and their debt service ratios are even less given where interest rates are. There's just incredible propensity to drive growth again if, uh, if they start to use their balance sheets. And banks have incredible lending capacity because no, they have, no one's been using it for a while. We've also had just an unprecedented rise in net worth, and that tends to have a very good relationship with future uh, growth as well. And again, not necessarily spent all in one year. It'll be post uh, policy. I think we're gonna get better productivity. I'll talk about that. And as Bruce and Jan have talked about, you could basically take this same list I just gave you and replicate it almost every place around the globe, at least to some degree. So I think a big issue isn't just whether we have transitory inflation, it's could we also have a growth environment that sustains at a 4% rate or something in this maybe twice as great as the GDP growth rate that we've had in a few years. Um, on inflation, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about, about these lists here again. I think there is a fair amount of disinflation force. Yes, policy is outsized and, and simply unprecedented. There's nothing like it. They're doing all they can to create runaway inflation. There's no doubt about it. But they're up against some pretty formidable, uh, uh, pretty formidable competition here to do it. Um, I'll, I'll visit a little later about uh, both demographics and productivity. The U.S. competitive situation today is just so much more advanced than what it was when we went into the 1970s, which everyone seems to fear. It isn't even close. Uh, and that is a very different environment than we were when we were largely a closed economies headed into the 1970s. In 1960s, probably the leading industry 
uh, in this country was the automobile sector and, and basically the tagline was sticker prices go up every year. The leading industry today is technology and the tagline is sticker prices go down every year. One was an inflationary leader, one's a deflationary leader. We also don't have anywhere as close to the mindsets that we had in the 1970s in terms of inflation and uh, anticipating it. We're a far cry from that. We could get there, but we're a far cry from it right now. We've had collapsing monetary velocity in this country for 20 years. Um, you know, it's not the same where we had flat to rising velocity in the 60s and 70s. And finally, at least yet, there is resource slack. I'll come back to that uh, in just a minute. So let's switch uh, now to the policy that we've uh, adopted here, not only in the United States, but globally. And I would say the policy to me is called go big, uh, probably from Yellen. And I think there's two uh, reasons that they're doing this. I think it's the conscious effort. I think um, they, they said, look, we, we've been dealing with the inflationary ghost of the 1970s for four decades. So we've always been quick to tighten and slow to ease and, and reserved on how much we ease and for how long we ease. And what has it got us? Well, it certainly killed off inflation. We haven't ever had that come back. But it slowly and continually eroded the propensity to grow to all to the extent that in the last recovery, which was a 10 year recovery, we barely grew more than 2%. Slowest recovery ever in our history as a result of the chronically worrying about inflation around every corner. So I think part of this is just having a nasty 20 years um, here. Maybe you just come to the conclusion as policy officials and general leaders of the country that man, we ought to just try something different here. Maybe it won't work, maybe it'll get us in trouble, but the way we're going, growth, even during expansions, is getting to the point where it can't support most of the population. So income distribution warps and uh, among a lot of other issues I got laid out here that are just very concerning. So I think there's some, press, there, there's some reason to, to try something new, and I think that's what they've adopted. There's also a precedent for success. The 70s is certainly a precedent for failure, and that is one possibility, no doubt about it but there's also a precedent for success. And I wonder if that's part of their thinking in adopting the policies they are. Well, let's just uh, bring that in as we talk a little bit about inflation, a little more general here. Um, this is the chart that goes back to 1950 and it's, I think it's go big policy. What's behind that is the idea that we're gonna run it hot. That's what we're gonna do. We're tired of worrying about running it too hot. We're gonna run this hot and see, see if we get more real growth rather than inflation uh, and then it works. And I don't know what the appropriate measure is for running it hot, but this is a darn good one in my book. It's, it's just looking at the difference between annual nominal GDP growth and the 10 year treasury deal. When, when you look at the degree of how hot we're running it, I don't think it's a bad measure to say, what's our nominal activity versus the interest rate structure of the economy? And you can see that we've run this thing cold for much of the last four decades, almost all the time. Sometimes really cold, where we had growth far below the, the, the rate structure in the economy, a very deflationary, disinflationary force. But we have run it hot. And one of those periods, so say 65 to 70, was an utter disaster. And one of those periods from 50 to 65 was a huge success often called uh, the golden years of capitalism. And uh, as you do this policy today, and we are running it hot, and I think we're probably gonna continue running it hot, um, do we end up here or do we end up here? I think that's the question of the day. Um, the certainly policy, when you look at this alone, uh, makes you think of inflation, but it's interesting, if I go back to the 1950s, that 50 to 65 period, that also was started by an outsized policy surge in World War II. Now, the World War II surge was often considered to finally end the Great Depression in this country. Will the COVID war policy surge be looked at a few years down the road as the thing that finally ended, ended the great financial crisis uh, of 2009 
and the pathetic growth that we've had since? I don't know. We did get a surge of inflation, but just like the Fed has told us, it was a very short-term transitory surge from this policy, and then it went down and we had stability the rest of the time. Maybe we do this again. Um, what does the 50s look like? And this is annual real GDP growth, and the red line is, is the 10-year Treasury yield. And it's quite amazing. We ran this about 3.5%, the growth rate, higher than the average 10-year Treasury yield for 15 years. And we ran it hot, and we never... Uh, it, uh, the, but the economy stayed cool in terms of inflationary fallout and yields. Um, a lot of concerns about how high yields are going to go. But if you look at this, even after 15 years, we we're barely above 4% 10-year Treasury yield uh, after that period of time. And I know there's differences. You know, we're pegging the currency. There's other things going on. But it is a great example of how you can potentially run this hot and still have a relatively low interest rate environment, even for several years. Um, what about the big differences between now and the 50s, uh, 50, 65 and the 65 to 70 period? Is it more like going into the 70s or more like coming into the 50s? And I would argue it's more like coming into the 50s. Um, if you look at the chart here on the left, the labor force growth during the decade of the, of the 70s was 2.5% per annum. All the rest of the time in post-war history was about one, a little over 1%. In the last five years, from 15 through 19, it's right at that level of 1%. That's probably what we're, where we are in general, um, overall. Um, I think this had a huge thing to do with inflation, was growing uh, our labor force that fast. And again, it was a young labor force that grew into, uh, created a lot of inflationary pressure relative to supply capability. We're just not in that situation today, much more like 1950s. Over here, we also have an aging labor force that's continuing. The red dotted line, here's uh, the ratio of labor force of under 55 to over 55. As you can see, that's been falling for decades. Um, and the blue line is just the detrended level of the CPI index. So when it goes up, it's growing faster than its average. And when it goes down, it's growing slower than its average. Um, this is the only time when we had a young and rapidly growing labor force that we had runaway inflation. We are much more comparable to this type of environment today than the, than, uh, the other. Also, both the, both the 1950s and today were let off or preceded by a savings bomb. We certainly had one of these starting after World War II and commenced all the way to the, to the 1980, and we certainly have one today. And I do think it's going to come down a lot, but I'm not so sure it won't stay elevated or at least take a while or a few years, which makes it very comparable to what happened here. What does this mean for growth? Well, historically, if I take that savings bomb, which is savings as a percent of GDP in this case, and I overlay it on top of nominal GDP growth, uh, but I push the dotted red line forward by five years, so this savings bomb, bomb is leading trailing nominal GDP growth by five years. There's been a not a perfect, but pretty good relationship. When these savings rates went up, it was five years later that growth picked up. And when this savings rate came down, it was five years later that growth came down. We now are looking at this types of thing, which is very comparable to what we did entering the 1950s. Then there's productivity, and this is a huge question. There's, I, I highly doubt we'll get back to the productivity we had in 1950, 1965. Um, We've been running half of that. But there is some hope, I think, on this chart. The blue line in this chart is the detrended level of US productivity. So again, when it rises, productivity is growing faster than the post-war average. And when it falls, it's growing slower than the post-war average. The red line in this chart is the relative total return performance of uh, the technology sector, going back to late 1940s, actually. The key here is it's pushed forward or it's leading by three years. And historically, when you've had a surge in technology leadership, three years later, you've had a significant pickup in productivity. And we look en route to have one of those. It makes sense. Technology is all about disruption and innovation, and cap spending and new methodologies uh, introduced on your labor force. And you can see the 1970s was just the opposite, where we had chronic falling productivity in that period of time. 
nothing like what we probably will see in this uh, period. Lastly, we, we certainly don't have, as I said, the inflationary culture that we had heading into the 1970s, up here expecting 4% inflation even before we got to the decade. We're very comparable, I think, more to uh, where we were in the 1950s uh, overall. So um, let me just end on this. Um, the go big, I have reservations as, a, as, as an investor, I'm extremely worried about overheated growth. I'm extremely worried about inflation, which would be an utter disaster for stock and bond prices. No doubt about that. Um, and it, it does worry me. And again, I'm not sure which way this will go, but it could turn out that go big turns out to be nothing but a horrendous uh, and colossal uh, mistake. But I do see some reason for why they're at least trying this on, as I say, and I think there is some hope that it does work. And uh, it, we may run this with a little higher inflation, but also higher real growth. And that could be a, a, a sustainable system again uh, in the in future years. And I guess I right now leaning a little bit more towards this view than the other. At least I'll give you something to think about. Uh, with that, I'll I'll stop and see if I can get out of here again um, and get it back to you. Thank you. Um, well, all three of you painted an extremely optimistic picture about the future. So I think you're going to leave it to me to play devil's advocate here. Force me to be a good journalist. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Paulson. I, I wonder, you, you know, you kind of enumerated a lot of disinflationary forces in the economy right now. And I wonder if those disinflationary forces dominate and we don't get back up to higher interest rates, what that means for the Fed's rate path, given their new uh, framework, and then you know if it means a long period of low rates, what that means for financial stability risks. That, I'm sorry, Dean. I was trying to get this figured out. Just, just give me a short <laughs> version of that one more time, Jim. <laughs> yeah. So you, you you sort of laid out a lot of reasons to think disinflation could dominate. You know, if if we do see some sort of disinflationary forces winning the day here, what does that mean for the Fed's policy path going forward? And then you know, if we have a long period of low rates, what does that mean for, for financial stability? Um. Well, I, I think that um, I'm not sure what the Fed will do. I mean, I, they're so out of bounds right now, as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I, as I say, I can understand maybe where they're coming from, but it is bizarre. Uh, I, I would have probably pulled back stimulus a long time ago already. And so I'm not sure if they'll do that. And one of the problems with that, Jenna, is, is if we get the burst and it comes back down, then they're going to feel emboldened that go big is the way to go. And I'm not so sure if, particularly if the, if the midterms remain Democrat or even strengthen it further, um, I'm not so sure we might continue to adopt that policy and get more comfortable with it. Uh, so I, I, I'm unsure where that goes. Um, but, but, but I would say the odds favor the Fed starts tapering later this year, uh, in my view, and fiscal juice runs out and probably uh, what's been passed is going to continue to filter through, but there's not a lot more uh, passed on top of that. And these sustainable forces that I talk about take, take place. The last thing on financial stability, I think we're a long ways, in my view, from behaviors that bring about financial instability at this point. I, I know people agree, you know, certainly there's evidence of SPACs and, and IPOs and, um, you know, and we had retail, Reddit, and we had all those, things. but to me, I still think people are suffering from whiplash and just cannot come to grips with the idea that after suffering the biggest collapse ever in our history, that we're suddenly all okay again. And you really get the worst uh, financial risk when everyone thinks we're all okay again. And I, I know that we've been fairly optimistic, but I, I think on average, I still read a lot more about all the reasons that you should be scared today about things that could blow up, whether we're in a bubble, whether the Fed's overdoing it, whether then I do the other way around. And so I, I think we'll get there eventually, Jenna, and, and eventually attitudes will get to the point where people get out over their skis. But right now I'm also looking at private sector balance sheets, which are immensely high quality to me, and they're obviously extremely liquid. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and then, Jan, I wonder if I could ask you a question. You know, you painted 
similarly a pretty optimistic picture here. You talked a lot about how, no matter how, how sort of how you ran the data, you didn't get a big overheating here. But I guess I wonder what happens if you're wrong. You know, if we do get an inflation overheating, is the Fed going to be nimble enough in reacting to that given their, their existing framework? Or do you think that there are concerns that things could truly get over out of hand and we could have the 1960s on repeat here? I think they would react, and that is one, I think, very important reason to think that the the upside on inflation is limited. I mean, could you get to, you know, two and a half percent, you know, two and three quarters for core PC over some period? It possibly. I mean, that's definitely, it's not in our forecast, but you could get to 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 those kinds of levels. But I think especially if it looks like that's also uh, that is also manifesting itself and leading to higher long-term inflation expectations. Where you know right now you're probably somewhere around two percent if you translate the different inflation expectations measures into sort of the core PCE path. But if that number was two and a half or two and three quarters over the long haul, yeah, I think you'd you'd get a you know, a, a much more adverse monetary policy response. And I think that is one key difference with the 19, late 1960s or 1970s experience when the Fed just wasn't really focused on stability of long-term inflation expectations. And actually there were no data. I mean, there, there was nothing that you could even look at uh, in terms of inflation expectations. There was some one-year data, but there was no tips market. There was no long-term uh, consumer expectation, and now the focus on that is is so, you know, so strong that I think you just get a very different policy response. Interesting, and I'd actually love to sort of push you on that a little bit further, um, because it seems like just you know, given the experience of this week, Janet Yellen, who's not even at the Fed, hinted <laughs> that the Fed might might have to raise rates if things overheat down the road and markets immediately gyrated. And so I guess the question is, you know, what are the financial stability implications if we do see the Fed move aggressively, quickly, in any way that the markets aren't already anticipating? Well, it would be bad for financial markets, obviously, in the, in the short term. I mean, you'd get a, a sizable equity sell-off, probably. You know, I, I do think there would be a period during which it wasn't, you know, it wouldn't be totally clear how quickly you'd be able to get inflation under under control. And you probably would have to generate some real economic weakness, actually, you know, reduce employment levels and, uh, you know, at least relative to, to potential. So that basically means the unemployment rate rises or employment to population comes down. Historically, it's been very difficult to do that without generating a recession. So even if they end up man managing uh, to do that without a recession, there'd be a period of uncertainty about that. I mean, there's never been an increase in the unemployment rate of more than you know, a third of a percentage point on a, on a three month average basis that, uh, that, that didn't result in a, in a recession. So no, I think that there would definitely be a, a near term price to pay, but from a you know three year five year horizon, I yeah you know, I don't think will there's really any appreciable chance of getting back to the kind of 1970s environment. Okay, interesting. Um, and then, Mr. Kasman, you know, my ears perked up when you said this, and clearly based on the questions that are coming in, so did all of our listeners. Um, but you mentioned that you know, we might see a slightly higher neutral rate just given the size of the fiscal response and the things that the Fed's doing right now. And I guess I wonder what the implications of that are for financial stability, given that it seems like a lot of market participants, among them the U.S. government, are, you know, sort of penciling in this low rate future. And I, I guess I wonder if our star rises, what that means, what that means. So, I mean, just one, one general comment, which is that I do think, um, low R star and low inflation have been um, both problematic for uh, the global economy and the US economy, perhaps more so for central banks like the ECB and the BOJ and, and countries that have had lower inflation and more constraints. So, you know, one thing to just recognize here is an environment of rising inflation, an environment of rising R star to the extent that it's happening, um, 
is a positive thing. We should celebrate it to the extent that it happens. Um, and and it, it's risk in terms of uh, uh, government borrowing costs and financial instability issues um, in terms of a, a, a rise that in the vicinity of 50 to 100 basis points, perhaps it, what I would look for for the next year or so, two years, is not something I think is, which is a problem. Obviously, with the same conversation on inflation, there's a point at which things get far enough that they become a problem either because of the Fed response or because of what kind of risk premium get put into uh, markets. But I, I kind of feel like the conversation on inflation almost immediately jumps to thinking about the 1970s without recognizing that A, inflation is very low right now, and B, if we got uh, a 75 basis points rise in US core inflation, if it was controlled, that would be an extremely positive thing. Now on the R star story, I think it's an unobservable variable, so I could say whatever I want, which is uh, um, you know, part of the issue here. Um, but to the extent that we think about R star as the interest rate in the economy that is consistent with stable utilization rates, I think we can recognize that there was a combination of some secular forces, but also some forces specifically related to the global financial crisis that promoted a long period of um, tight credit, a long period of cautious behavior on the part of uh, businesses and households uh, that generated a period not that, that didn't last the whole expansion, but, but for the center point of that expansion actually generated sustained fiscal policy. And all of that contributed to a, a falling R star. What I'm arguing is not that I have the crystal ball on US potential growth and some of the more secular forces, but I think credit channels are gonna be reasonably open. I think fiscal policy is gonna be supportive. Uh, uh, for a while here. And I think that is going to promote a higher equilibrium rate that would be consistent with keeping GDP growth at, at, at its potential utilization rate stable. And I think that's a hugely positive thing in terms of getting more transmission for central bank policy, which we are arguing is very accommodated, but it's accommodated if you have strong growth and a rising R star, because you can get into the other situation where the zero bound constraint hits and if the uh, R star is falling as it was in the latter part of the last decade, we saw the BOJ, ECB to some degree uh, get into problems uh, with that. Uh, in terms of what it means for the Fed neutral rate, I think it's pretty straightforward, which is if we get that and we get the additional traction because R star is going up, then we're probably talking about a neutral rate more in the range uh, nominally of about 3% rather than something closer to 2% which gives you a sense that when, when the Fed gets going, if this is the environment we're in, then there's probably more to do. And I think the, you know, to my mind, and I, I agree with Jan 100%, the Fed's not gonna let inflation get out of control here. This is not a conversation really about, do we go back to the 70s? It's a conversation about, does the inflation process move in a, a constructive enough fashion? And is it, is it manageable enough that we can actually have it with a long and productive business cycle that builds the other kinds of macro outcomes that we want to see. Uh, and that's a really you know, um, you know, tough call to make at this point. I would argue that the Fed is comfortable with inflation in the mid twos, that their uh, more aggressive reaction function would start to kick in if they, if they felt there was a meaningful chance of inflation moving above 3%. So in the, in the context of what Jan was talking about, the reaction function and being very dovish, I'm, I'm with him there all, on board, but I probably have a, a more of a, of a tilt upward in inflation uh, without us getting into a story about, you know, 1970 style inflation. I, I would just see, think that in the next two years, we could easily see core PC running closer to two and a half percent as we, as we move through this cycle. Right. Absolutely. And actually I'd be, I'd be interested to hear Jan and then Jim from both of you on, you know, as, as Bruce has kind of laid out how much extra going to tolerate this time around com as compared to what they've tolerated in years past. And they haven't identified that average inflation target. So Jan, I'd be really interested to hear what you think, what you think they're going to allow. Yeah, I think probably relative to Bruce, my inflation forecast is a little lower and my expectation for the threshold for the Fed is also a little lower. And then ultimately these, these numbers in terms of the the, the forecast for what the Fed's going to do basically cancel out. I mean, we've sort of said maybe 2.2% is going to be the threshold for, uh, you know, for, for lift off. If they want to be 
somewhere in the two and a quarter to two and a half percent range. And if, you know, when liftoff comes, you're still very accommodative. You'd still be expecting the economy to continue growing above trend. Then ultimately, you you know, maybe converge sort of asymptotically, at least in the forecast. In reality, it's always going to be jumpier. But in the forecast, you converge asymptotically to maybe two and a half percent or a little bit less. That's, uh, that's the way we've thought about it. If I look at the March projections, I mean, it seems like the, the, right now what they're, what they're showing in the summary of economic projections is probably a threshold of 2.1 or 2.2%. It's not entirely clear. Over time, my expectation would be that maybe that drifts a little bit higher, could be 2.3, uh, but you know, that's partly just sort of passage of, of time perhaps, and partly because I don't think there will be any hawks appointed to the Board of Governors. I mean, I don't know how much turnover there's going to be, but I do not expect any hawkish appointments. I, I just throw out that, you know, I, I think the Fed um, is pretty clear. I, I, I think they'd be willing to tolerate fairly high inflation. I mean, you know, maybe two and a half to three if they really felt the jobs market was still slack. In other words, I think that's where it's gonna, rubber's gonna hit the road. And they're gonna look at uh, not just, not just the, uh, you know, the, the U3 unemployment rate or the U, they're, they're gonna look at the broader definitions of unemployment. They're gonna look at the labor force uh, participation rates and the elasticity of, a, of the unemployment rate at whatever level. And then I think they're also gonna be very tied into what's going on with real compensation. And unless real compensation is making advances, I think even relative to business, I'm not sure they'd necessarily be so quick to pull it in. I think that's just where they've kind of gotten themselves at this point. And they're certainly in bed with the treasury, uh, I think, which is very odd. <laughs> I guess, you know, on the on that point, I guess I wonder. You you mentioned earlier that you feel that the Fed has lost some element of its independence, and I wonder how you're identifying that independence or defining it, because it seems like it's one of those words that means different things to different people. Well, um, I think that there's a, I, I think that they've adopted similar. What bothers me a little bit is they've just adopted such similar uh, philosophies. Let's put it that way. Um, you know where politically on the treasury side, you, you could say, okay, we have political goals of, of uh, income distribution, of climate change, of some of these things. Somehow, a lot of these issues have found their way into Fed policy. Um, you know, different groups, not just a macro a policy, but different groups, that it may be okay, I don't know, but, I, but I'm saying that that just seems like you're mirroring up uh, something that was an autonomous, independent body uh, focused on economic stability uh, and growth that now is getting into uh, focusing on political issues. And I think that's joined them. And then there's also just the fact that they work together on the Fed and, uh, you know, they have a pa past pretty close relationship. They just, the policies are so mirrored uh, to me. And I think that's very different than it's been in the past. Bruce, Jan, I wonder if either of you would like to respond to that. Um, I would have some sympathy for, you know, that view, but I would want to also emphasize as we think about that, the idea of a more fundamental shift that's taken place on the Fed, uh, which is, I think, if we went back 10 or 15 years ago, we would think that the Fed's attitude about the world, more than, more than 10 years before the GFC, um, the Fed's attitude of the world was, if they hit their inflation objective, you know, they got, they got the job done and um, more or less other macro objectives would be achieved, that there was a convergence of the dual mandate almost to one mandate. And I think what has happened in the last 10 or 15 years is a um, recognition that both it, um, it is not clear that inflation outcomes will give you your macroeconomic objectives more broadly, but equally important that bad macro policy can lead to actually bad structural outcomes, that there is no you know, unique equilibrium in the world and that the Fed 
can actually affect that. Um, and I think the political side of this is interesting. As Jan is saying, the kind of appointments we're going to get to the Fed are going to be influenced by the political environment here. But I think there's a fundamental theoretical shift that gives the Fed more willingness to test the limits on the labor market. I think there's something in that in terms of why they removed um, tight labor markets as a reaction function element as they shifted the, the framework that basically gives them a willingness to test the limits uh, on tight labor markets with the idea that they may actually be able to generate better longer term outcomes here uh, in terms of the monetary policy experiment they're running right now. I, I agree with Bruce on, on that point. On the previous one, on whether you know the Fed and the and and the Treasury or the Fed and the administration are too close to one another, I thought Janet Yellen actually said it very well yesterday or two days ago when she uh, you know maybe qualified some some of what she'd said previously uh, and said if anybody knows about the importance about of, about the importance of Fed independence, it's me. So I don't have any problem. I don't think there is any problem with the Treasury Secretary having been the Fed Chair previously. I don't. I don't think it introduces any issues of, you know, any any additional concerns about Fed independence, and. You know, Fed independence is never absolute, but I'm I don't I don't think that there is a you know particularly large problem of threats to Fed independence at the moment. Okay, interesting, interesting. And then you know, Bruce, you talked a little bit about the fact that they've clearly taken away that sort of employment. Um, overshoot idea within within their rates framework. They haven't taken it away in the QE framework. And so I wonder, you know, what you think sort of the employment side of things means for the potential for taper. And then also, you know, how how ready are we for taper? Are we going to have a tantrum again? So I think to my mind, the rate story is relatively easy to link to the macroeconomic outlook. And you can actually see it in the way they describe the conditions. There's some vagueness in how you want to you know, judge whether those conditions are met, but inflation at 2% sustainably above, on uh, a path to say sustainably above 2% and, and uh, you know, getting back effectively to full employment, those are relatively straightforward. The balance sheet is more complicated and, and the balance sheet is more complicated for a good reason, which is that the balance sheet straddles both macroeconomic objectives and also the objectives that were put in place with the crisis to maintain market functioning and also to just generally deal with financial stability issues. And I think the, the really difficult point about the balance sheet here is we don't really know yet. They haven't, they haven't started to have the conversation, of course, about how they're gonna weigh those forces. And I think uh, um, you know, President Kaplan earlier today was talking about his view that we're already at a point we should have that conversation because financial markets are functioning well um, and it's hard to justify uh, why you keep keep going on that front, but that's not the only thing that's in the picture. As you know, as we're, you're talking about a tantrum, a tantrum, the Fed has the the memory of 2013 in its head, uh, which happened, by the way, at another time we had a transition in Fed leadership, um, and uh, I think they're very sensitive to that. So I have a hard time knowing exactly how they're balancing it. I do think they're erring on the side of being slow. I also think they're erring on the side of not leaving before they leave, which is to basically say they're not going to signal the change on this till pretty uh, late in the game. Um, and I'm much less sitting with conviction on whether it happens in September, December, or March than I would be about you know whether what is the path here for rates. Where you know Jan and I can maybe have a debate on this, but I, I actually think it's really hard to see the Fed pushing its tightening before the end of 22, 23 into 24. The macro environment can change things, but I think they're they're going to stand pretty firm here in terms of guiding us that they can they can live through a lot of macro surprises and still keep policy rates on hold for you know well over a, a year from now. So, Janet, can I just make one comment in that? Um, the you know I, when I look back at the tapering since we've had quantitative easing, I mean, yeah, they. They, some of them lead to some turbulence in the stock market, for example, but it's generally fairly brief. 
I mean, 2011, 2013, I mean, we, and then there was constant tapering from 14 on. The stock market just went higher. And, you know, economy did too. I mean, I, I don't really, I think we tend to blow that up a little bit more than we should because, yeah, there's pullbacks to the market. But, you know, I think we probably have 10% pullback in the market for some reason anyway, most of those times. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is, you know, we have not yet tapered in the economy that may be growing, you know, six to 8% in real GDP terms against a rate structure that's 2%. I'm not sure it's gonna matter near as much as when we're tapering, you know, with a 3% rate structure and, uh, you know, and, and uh, real growth of two. You know, it's just, it's just a different sort of tapering environment. It's an interesting point. Um, one, of our, one of our audience members has a sort of better way of asking a question I asked earlier. I asked you to all sort of define for me what you think of as the Fed's inflation goal in their new framework. And rather than focusing on the Fed's reaction function, the audience member is asking, you know, what kind of inflation overshoot would concern you? So it's obvious that we're not headed back toward the 1970s, but how hot is too hot? Um, you know, maybe we could start with you. I mean, I, I would be most concerned by an unanchoring of long-term expectations. So it's less about the spot you know, core PCE number than it is probably about a composite of the different indicators of long-term inflation expectations. I mean, of course, could you write down a, a, a core PCE number that would mean, you know, most likely something has gone seriously wrong? Sure. But I, I don't know if it's, it is as easy to draw a line in the sand. So if it turned out that because of short-term factors where there's a, a good story for why they're going to unwind, core PCE goes to 3% for, you know, a period. I, I don't think that necessarily would be, would be a concern. Is, is it likely that, you know, at some point, once you get to that or higher, you'd also have some, some issues in, in uh, long-term inflation expectations? Absolutely. But that's really what I would be most focused on. Um, if I could jump in, I'll just say I'm, you know, answering this question is partly about whether you are comfortable with the Fed's current inflation objective, leaving aside the, the operating uh, uh, principles. So I'm going to basically say I would be very comfortable with a somewhat higher inflation objective than 2%, but I'm not going to go there. But I, I would say that consistent with what the Fed's uh, inflation um, averaging framework uh, should deliver, I don't see any reason why five years of two and a half percent inflation would be uh, inappropriate in that context, although they haven't really defined the parameters of it. So I think to try to get a glide path that for a few years time, you get to the mid twos to me would be what the Fed should be doing, whether they can manage that without getting into the problem that Jan described becomes a, a, a really important issue. But that's where I would be hoping that they're shooting for um, in terms of their object, objectives for the next few years. I'll just real quickly, Jay, to say that uh, um, I agree with both Bruce and Jan's comments, um, but I, I just think that the financial markets, st stocks uh, and, would, and bonds would both have problems, I believe, if you had a 3% uh, PCE core for any length of time. And that might solve the issue right there. Because if the bond market does have a problem, they're going to make it the Fed's problem, <laughs> and stock market will join in. And that might, I think, three percent is my guess of an area that, if it's sustained, would be, would be the, would be tough. <laughs> Good point to end on. Um, we we are fresh out of time, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Dimitri for uh, the next panel. Um, but thank you guys all so much for a really interesting conversation. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully your optimistic outcomes outlooks come true. Thanks. Thank you all very, very much. Very interesting, and um, I'm very glad to hear of this optimistic uh, consensus about the the, uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, and I hope that you are right. Uh, I do share your views about inflation, but I'm not sure that I am so um, euphoric about the eight percent. Um, of growth, but yet. Thank you very, very much again.